Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. Uh, my wife was critiquing my piece and saying it's way too long. And I remembered my English teacher, Mrs. Davis, who once called me verbose, um, but uh, of whom I was very fond of. Macro thoughts. Um, I was responding to an article Howard French wrote in World Politics Review and he used the word cocksure about Z in pink. And uh, I responded to him and of course, this is Hong Kong uh, is on one side and a separate issue will come to it. But with respect to the market, I think this week um, Z Jinping has wrestled the market console from Trump um, and confirmed he has good reason to be cocksure, frankly. This is mind-bending, Jedi-level stuff, in my opinion. Um, as I wrote over the weekend, Z Jinping is signalling he has control of the console. Of course, that took me back to another article where I was quoting Don DeLillo. The specialist is monitoring data on his mission console when a voice breaks in. A voice that carried with it a strange and unspecifiable poignancy. He checks in with his flight dynamics and conceptual paradigm officers at Colorado Command. We have a deviate tomahawk. We copy, there's a voice. We have gross oscillation here. There's some interference. I've gone redundant, but I'm not sure it's helping. We are clearing an outframe to locate source. Thank you, Colorado. It is probably just selective noise. You are negative red on the step function quad. It was a voice, I told them. We have just received an affirm on selective noise. We will correct Tomahawk in the meantime, advise you to stay redundant. The voice, in contrast to Colorado's metallic pitching, is a melange of repartee, laughter and song with a quality of purest, sweetest sadness. Somehow we're picking up signals from radio programs of 40, 50, 60 years ago. Santiago AU Fund tweeted this image, which of course tied into the idea of the console. And to that point, you can see, you know, there was a headline zero hedge put out, futures suddenly explode higher on Chinese conciliatory headline. And that's my point, they have the console now. And I wrote over the weekend, what is clear is that Xi Jinping has repelled the US advance. And this past week's one price action was a message delivered with finesse and subtlety and whose import cannot be ignored. The point is this, the one is now the catalyst and China has signaled it will be a shock absorber. Xi Jinping was also signaling he had control of the console. That article was, I, I call the feedback loop phenomenon. 9th of July last year, I was asking tariff wars who blinks first, and I think we got that answer this week. Home thoughts, um, since I've been looking at Kashmir from there, I jumped to Tariq Ali, Tariq Ali took me to Ghalib. Love demands patience, Desire is restless. What colour shall I paint the heart until you savage it? You shall not ignore me when the time comes. I know, but I may turn to dust before the news reaches you. And then I perceive the world as a playground where dawn and dusk appear in eternal rounds in his universal form is a plaything, the throne of Solomon. The miracles of the Messiah seem so ordinary in my eyes. Without name, I cannot comprehend any form. 
illusionary, but is the identity of all objects. My anguish envelops the entire desert. Silently flows the river in front of my floods. Ask not what separation has done to me. Just see your poise when I come in front of you. Truly, you say that I am egotistical and proud. It is the reflection, O oh friend, in your limited mirror to appreciate the style and charm of conversation. Just bring in the goblet and wine. Hatred manifests due to my envious mind. Thus, I say, don't take his name in front of me. Faith stops me while temptations attract, in spite of Kaaba behind and church ahead. I am the lover, yet notorious is my charm. Thus Layla calls names to Majnu in front of me, dies not one, though the union is a delight, in premonition of the separation night. Alas, this be it, the bloody separation wave. I know not what else is in store ahead of me. Though the hands didn't move, the eyes are alive. Wine and goblet, let them stay in front of me, says Galen. Conscience is companion and trusted friend. Don't pass any judgment in front of me. Campari sells the most expensive home on earth at a 43% discount. Davide Campari Milano Spa reached a preliminary agreement to sell the historic Villa Le Cedre on the French Riviera for 200 million euros to an unspecified buyer for private use. Villa was among the assets that the Italian distiller acquired with its 2016 purchase of Grand Manier Group. Prices below 30, 350 million euros at which the villa was listed. And uh, the property was owned by King Leopold of Belgium, surrounded by a 14 hectare botanical garden. The villa is on a peninsula that juts into the Mediterranean between Nice and Monaco. This is a photograph of the Villa Les Cedre, and this is a photograph of the coastline in the Mediterranean Sea beyond the private gardens. Political reflections, in light of the assurances we have received, there are no longer any reasonable grounds for the continued legal detention of the Grace One in order to ensure compliance with the EU sanctions regulation. It was not immediately clear when the Grace One would sail as the US made a late request to seize the vessel. This is a matter of our independent mutual legal assistance authorities who will make an objective legal determination of that request for separate proceedings, Picardo said. Then uh, E.J. E. Malray, who seems to respond uh, like who does for the Chinese government except for the Iranians. In response, Iran will release the British flagged tanker Stena Impero captured by the IRGC Special Forces before Saturday midday. That's interesting that he chose to put a timeline. But he concluded by saying they're preparing for the worst case scenario. The war of tankers is far from ending. It is just a beginning. And that brings me back to something I was quoting on the 17th of June, Stratfor, who said the overwhelming confidence that Iran is displaying both in rhetoric and action, is astounding. And 13th of May, I'd sort of characterized Iran as being at that Hunter S. Thompson age. There is no honest way to explain it because the only people who really know where it is are the ones who have gone over. And I said, if the US thinks Tehran will just roll over, which appears to be the case, 
Then they are exhibiting the same deluded ideas that they exhibited the day before the peacock throne got plucked. Iran, I said, is a geopolitical bleeding edge. Let's move on to Hong Kong, which I characterized as part of the periphery, which is a boil that will not be lanced. Um, this is a report from Global Times. When Hong Kong youngsters were incited to protest on the street, the ringleaders who are messing Hong Kong up were enjoying dinner with their foreign advisors to further scheme the Hong Kong riots. And this must be how it's played in China, of course. Then in response uh, to uh, um, uh, another Global Times tweet as the former US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton came out in support of the Hong Kong mobs on Twitter, a netizen replied that places she has ever supported, like Libya, Syria, all of these countries stand in ruins. The US is interfering with our internal affairs publicly. I call that a one-two punch. This is interesting. And via Zero Hedge, he called on Friday, that's today, that Hong Kong citizens take out all bank deposits. Primary goal is Chinese banks. But he said that other banks should also be targeted, otherwise Chinese banks can borrow money from other banks to solve their problems. Goodness. And that's why it is a tinderbox. But look at this strong support coming out of China mainland for Hong Kong stocks. This is the China Hong Kong Connect, major support from China buyers. Figures are in dollars. That's from Sun Chartist. Jailed Saudi activist Luja Al Hatlul refuses to deny being tortured in exchange for freedom. What a brave lady. I really don't understand why. You know, if you are making these reforms, you want to jail people calling for them at the same time. Surely they could be partners with you in this reform process. The US economy doesn't appear as strong as Trump said. Chinese society has full confidence to fight a prolonged war with the US. That's you. Um, uh, trade war and Hong Kong riots have hit U.S. positive image in China. A Chinese society is more united politically and can afford a long-term fight. 27th of May, I was quoting, if there is a decoupling between the two economies, so be it. The Chinese people can endure more pain than the spoiled and hubristic American. International markets traders have been gripped by a once-in-a-generation dash to safety. Indeed, it's remarkable. Treasuries, gold and Japanese yen are clocking the largest number of outsized rallies combined since at least 1990, according to Bank of America Corporation. The latest milestone in the haven frenzy arrived this week with the yield on 30-year U.S. Treasuries slipping below 2% for the first time. Investors have not been so worried about the future in the past 30 years, Bank of America strategist led by Stefano Pascale wrote. Charge into havens this month has been spurred by flashing recession indicators trade war, tit for tat, data disappointments, all amid thin liquidity. Gold is up about 18% this year, last at 15.15. Uh, yen is the top performer against the dollar, um, so really quite extraordinary. With the US long bond future ripping more than 5% above the 50-day moving average, Justin Walters of Bespoke Investment Group notes that historically, more often than not, bonds reverse lower from here. Of course, the purest geopolitical proxy in the market is gold, and to what Bank of America describing, Ben Bernanke once said people hold gold as protection against what we call tail risks, really, really bad outcomes. 3rd of August, I was talking about the bid for safe haven assets has intensified Bank of America confirming as much, 
And I said, a weaker one, what's that? Let's have a look at that. Uh, 705, I think they'll behave themselves over the weekend. As I watched a weaker one, it will only intensify this impulse as it courses through the veins of the foreign exchange markets and other markets. I came across a report which did not get much uh, ventilation. German government expects disorderly Brexit on October the 31st. This is Handelsblatt via Delta One. I wrote about uh, Boris and Sterling on the 5th of August. I said, as I watched the pound fall like a stone, I could not help wondering if this sterling moment is precisely like that it was in 1992, a no-brainer. As sterling has recovered, it was about to dip below 120. We're now at 121.18. I still think it's 1992 redux. Boris isn't bluffing. Every action, every appointment, every word since the entry number 10 signals the same thing. Britain is leaving the EU on October the 31st. So the pound bounced as high as 121.50 yesterday, but remains not far from the 31-month low of 120.15. 120.50 acting as a floor for the pound, but I expect it to be tested. And the key question is a political one. Can Prime Minister Johnson self-eject Britain? Can he be stopped? This is a political calculation. He tweeted, Yesterday, the referendum result must be respected. We will leave the EU on the 31st of October. I've written about the bond market severally on the 3rd of June. I was calling it bond yields in tilt mode. You know that machine? I can't remember what it was called. It was like playing it when I was a young boy, and it would tilt. Markets and prices exhibit patterns of correlation. And essentially, my perspective is that it is the correlation that has exerted a pull effect on U.S. yields. And therefore, the recessionary signaling of the yield curve should be entirely discounted. Plus, you've had this extraordinary financial repression spillover effect. Haven't seen acute rate moves of this magnitude in the long end since the European financial crisis. That's higher than Keynes. 10-year U.S. Treasury yield touched 1.5%. Switzerland's 50-year bond yield is at negative 0.48%. It was plus 0.2% just one month ago. This is what I called a Wizard of Oz world on the 24th of June. Bond craze accelerates with the price of 100-year Austria bonds jumping above 200 has gained 74% year-to-date. U.S. retail sales ro rose by the most in four months and exceeded projections in July. And this is why I wrote severally and in the middle of July, specifically with respect to the U.S., stoking up the fire with rate cuts is a very dangerous situation because according to my calculations the Fed will be need to be raising rates into the election, something that will turn Trump apoplectic, I'm sure. 24th of June, if you were to look at the US economy in isolation, you'd have to say such a forecast is absurd. The economy has some soft spots, but unemployment is at multi-decade lows, and consumer spending holding up. Um, uh, and as I said, and J.S. Blockland looked at this chart, U.S. retail sales continued their strong run up 1% in July. Currency markets, euro dollar falling 110.83, dollar index 98.164, Japanese yen, um, on which so much hinges, and it's very exponential in the way it trades, 106.14. Uh, Swiss franc 0.9784, the pound 121.20, uh, doing much better against the euro. The Australian dollar 0.6777, India rupee 71.208, South Korean won 1210.75, the real back below 4, 399.17, the Brazilian Central Bank pronounced that they were going to intervene. 
Egyptian pound 16.5766. South African rand 15.2046. This is a dollar index chart from H2 Walsh. Um, you remember I've been bullish about the dollar since the beginning of the year. It's been a long journey though. Euro drops as ECB's reign makes big promises as stimulus package in September may beat expectations. When you're working with financial markets, it's often better to overshoot than undershoot, he said. And uh, this chart is from T Commodity Euro Dollar Poised to print a bearish engulfing candle on a weekly basis. This paves the way to a push towards 109.20. We're at 108.40. We're at 110, sorry, 110.84. Need to go back below 110. Uh, Deutsche Bank cocoa bonds, 6% coupon. The yield has risen to 13.5%. And those bonds are the first bank bonds to take losses in a crisis. So that's beginning to wobble as well. Uh, birdie word, horrified to realise that European bank stocks have formed an elephant's declining in size, technical formation, a global recession, pandemic beckons. The point is, look at, uh, look at the uh, collapse in the capitalisation of the banking sector as part of the stock market, and just generally. And this means uh, significant deterioration in their credit worthiness, which for now, Specifically in Europe, no one seems to be really, none of the regulators seem to be concerned about it. But it's spilled over everywhere. Um, in a 175 page report, Marco Polos accused General Electric of hiding $38.1 billion in potential losses and asserted that the company's cash situation was far worse than it had disclosed. GE's true debt to equity ratio is 17.1, not 3.1, which will undermine its credit status. The report says GE is insolvent and asserts that its industrial businesses have a working capital deficit of $20 billion. Um, uh, the report adds that GE's $38 billion in accounting fraud amounts to over 40% of GE's market capitalization, making it far more serious than either the Enron or WorldCom accounting frauds. In the statement, GE said we remain focused on running our business every day and will not be distracted by this type of meritless, misguided and self-serving speculation said it stood behind its financials and operates to the highest level of integrity in its financial reporting. Let's turn to gold. This is a chart from Adam Mancini. We're last at 15, uh, 14.44. It's been a huge run. Crude oil, lots of volatility, trading up this morning, $55.18. A 14.83 carat pink gem, the spirit of the rose, found and cut by Al Rosa PJSC, is expected to fetch one of the highest prices ever for a diamond when the Russian company puts it up for sale later this year. The oval stone named the spirit of the rose uh, has been certified as fancy, vivid, purple, pink with excellent clarity excellent polish and very good symmetry. Estimates the potential price of between 60 and 65 million dollars. This is Tracy Alloway who got in a conversation with myself and Sun Chartist and Sun Chartist asked for the Bitcoin avocado correlation which we've previously spoken about but what's interesting is the price of avocado. Even that parabola seems to be in a recession. I was talking previously about the crypto avocado millennial economy and I was talking about the zeitgeist of the time as its defining spirit or its mood, capturing the zeitgeist of the now is not an easy thing because we're living in a dizzyingly fluid moment. Gladwell stated ideas and products and messages and behaviours spread like viruses do um, and I said you know point is millennials discovered the virtues of avocado, the behavior spread like a virus and boom prices skyrocketed. Bitcoin, where is that? Let's take a look. 9,851. Key I think is 9,300. 
um, that's the area to keep an eye on. And you know, I can't, I can't put down John McAfee, who I called an enigmatic and mercurial fugitive and Bitcoin evangelist, who always seems to pop up in my feed like an acid trip. And his latest uh, tweet was conspiracy theorist, one who believes the absurd, ridiculous, or impossible. X, Epstein killed himself. Let's move on to Africa. Zimbabwe's police said it believes the opposition protests planned on Friday will turn violent and warned that the nation's security services will intervene if they do. In fact, they've cancelled it. Zimbabwe's police said it believes the opposition protests planned on Friday will turn violent. MDC said Wednesday it will proceed with a demonstration in the capital, Harare, and four other cities because of the dire economic situation, shortages of cash, fuel, electricity, as well as one of the world's highest inflation rates. Um, so, I've written about it many times, 29th of July, I said it's a laboratory experiment with inflation clocking 176%. I said there is a straw and camel's back moment, but predicting that moment is always a fool's errand. January the 21st, I thought it was at a tipping point moment, and I said there's a correlation between high inflation and revolutionary conditions. 8th of October, I was talking about the government's voodoo economics, where it spent $1.3 billion pump priming the economy ahead of the election. Money didn't have. And that was the straw that broke the camel's back. South African oil shares up 2.09% this year, seven month low, however. You know, I wrote in that feedback loop phenomenon that the purest proxy for the China, Asia, Ian, and Frontier markets feedback loop phenomenon, which by the way had been in a sweet spot for two decades, but now is undergoing a trend reversal, is the South African Rand, aka the Tsar. And according to markets, it looks like rand swings will get worse before they get better. It is the world's most volatile major currency, options pricing, and suggesting it's not going to lose that status anytime soon. Historical volatility climbs 61 basis points to 13.8%, highest among 16 major developed nations in emerging market currencies tracked by Bloomberg. Premium of options to sell the rand over those to buy it, known as 25 delta, delta risk reversal, widened 23 basis points to 338. Dollar versus rand at 1520. Egyptian pound 16.5785. EGX 30 up 9.66% year to date. Naira, that's going to come under pressure. The official rate is 306.90. Trade at rate 364, um, that's going to blow up if, if you see oil fall below 50. Nigerian all shares down 13.9% year to date. Ghana Stock Exchange down 6.32% year to date. Very interesting article in the African Business Magazine, Thomas Collins, about East African breweries. For almost a hundred years, drinking a beer in the East African region is routinely meant picking up a cold Tusca lager, the flagship product of EABL. The beer was named in honor of George Hurst, the co-founder of EABL's predecessor company, Kenya Breweries, who was killed by an elephant soon after the establishment of the firm in 1922. Second biggest company after Safaricom contributes approximately 1% of Kenya's GDP and its products have retained a reputation as some of Kenya's favorite brands. The critical thing we did when the business was soft in 2018 was to bite the bullet on some investment decisions we wanted to make. Indeed, they did. $10 million in a spirits expansion factory in Nairobi, then the poster child of our $150 million investment in the Kisumu Brewery. Big, big bet. And a good one. While that felt difficult at the time because the state of the business didn't warrant the investment, when the economy bounced, we really benefited. Uh, investment in low-end, low-margin beer, together with investment in high-end, high-margin spirits. 
um, pump some $500 million into the Kenyan Treasury each year, around 5% of the annual budget. Kenyan government has reduced excise duties on Senator de Keg. It took an awful long time to do that, which allows the low margin beer to remain commercially viable and to compete with dangerous home brews. Raise taxes, but raise them in a way which understands the elasticity of our categories, he says. The sweet spot is every other year the only other company which has contributed more to the Treasury is Safaricom, so don't kill the goose who's laying the golden egg. According to EABL in-house research, brandy has dominated the region as the brown spirit of choice. Uh, to the millennials who are looking at the world through their phone, Johnny Walker is way more aspirational than any other brown spirit in East Africa, said so Cowan. He describes a process of being provocative, highlights a number of EABL's key provocations which have steered taste buds away from basic lager towards ale and even cider. This market was either amber or black and nothing in between and actually this means you have loads of white space to play with. Tusker Ale has been our second provocation of Kenyan consumers. The first was Kenyan cider. One million new drinkers, this is the demographic dividend, come online each year across the region, according to Cowan, and EABL is positioning its innovative products to influence a segment that is yet to form its drinking habits. Coca-Cola referred to it as Sheriff Throat, we refer to it as Sheriff Wallet. Consumers have discretionary money to spend, it's about where they spend that money rather than rival companies. Our two biggest competitors are mobile phone data gambling. Cowan believes that Africa has the highest potential beer market in the world and applauds his local region for creating the right environment for business to flourish. Well worth reading actually. EABL uh, trades on a P ratio of 18.143. Uh, full year revenue was up 12.369%. Profit before tax up 51.72%. So talking about the bet that he put on. Um, CMA has approved the issuance of Kenya's first unlisted green bond to be issued by ACORN to raise 5 billion shillings to finance student accommodation. Moody's rates Helios no issue one notch above the sovereign because of a partial guarantee from Garantco. Kenya shilling 1 in 340 holding in there. Nairobi all share up 6.63% year to date. NSE 20 down 10.39% year to date. Thank you.